Well, after five straight up days for the S&P 500, it makes you wonder if the move back higher is going to be just as aggressive as the sell-off that we had a couple of weeks ago. I'm not complaining, uh, but uh, as a reminder, there's always risk present in the market. For those of you that have been feeling a little bit left behind because of the whipsaw action here recently, I do have a stock that has seemed to have been left behind to some degree, maybe rightfully so, but we're going to take a peek at that as our trade application example for today. So let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video. I'm your host, Brandon Van Zee. It's February 15th, 2018. Great to have each and every one of you on board here today, whether this is your first time watching or whether you're a regular viewer of these Market Outlook videos. A reminder, if you're not already subscribed to our YouTube channel, make sure you click that red button and do so immediately. In addition to that, you might want to click the little bell icon that's kind of attached to it there. That will notify you the moment that David and I upload these videos to YouTube. While you're over there, if you wouldn't mind giving us a thumbs up, uh, that's the indication that you appreciate having access to these videos for free and you want us to continue to do these videos uh, in the future. If you want to leave us a comment, you're welcome to do so as well by scrolling down. And then lastly, in the description area, we have a bunch of different links. One of them will allow you to sign up for our email distribution list. That will include the link to these videos each trading day, in addition to things like the overbought and oversold clusters within the S&P 500. Now, in addition to YouTube, we're also very big users of Twitter. Make sure you're following us on Twitter. My handle is at Brandon Van Zee, all one word. The Market Scholars handle is at Market underscore Scholars. And make sure you're following David Settle as well. He always has excellent information out there. We would really appreciate it if you like and retweet the Market Outlook uh, tweets every single night. Uh, we're genu genuinely, you'll find them pinned to the top of our Twitter feed. So for tonight, since I'm doing it, go to my Twitter account and at the top, you'll see the Market Outlook uh, tweet. Just go ahead and click the heart if you like it and then click the little uh, icon underneath it with the two arrows chasing each other around. That's the retweet icon and send that out to your social community. As you can imagine, David and I are starting a small business here. Uh, we need a grassroots effort uh, from all of you guys, our adamant supporters, in order to uh, have a chance at success at this. And we really, really appreciate that. Hopefully you got our Valentine's message there uh, on Twitter yesterday as well. Now, in addition to YouTube and Twitter, we're also on Facebook. You can check out that Facebook group uh, web address on the screen in front of you. And uh, there's over 800 of you that have joined that group, and we certainly appreciate that as well. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into the analysis of the markets here for the day. As you can see on the screen in front of you, uh, the S&P 500 closed up by more than a percent today, 1.21% to be exact. That was a 32-point advance for the S&P 500 index. Not only that, but it was a very bullish day yet again, meaning that we closed very close to the highs of the day, as you can see from the formation of this candle here. Generally speaking, if you're closing near the highs, that is a much, much more uh, bullish uh, feature than if you would be closing near the lows of the day. And so after five straight days, it's entirely possible we're, we'll be due for a rest here one of these days. After all, markets don't go straight up or go straight down. Uh, but it is certainly uh, a welcome relief. It was just a couple of weeks ago, there was a lot of nervousness in the air and everybody kind of had this feeling like, here we go, this is, this is gonna be the big one. We're finally going into a bear market. Uh, but the market has its own mind and that's why we need to read the market every single day. Um, you know, in a strange way, I kind of wish the market uh, would go into a bear market so that way I could get rid of my uh, terminology and constantly reminding my students that, hey, it's been nine years since we've had a bear market. At some point, if we've gone down 10% like we did here a few weeks back, let's just rip the Band-Aid off and get it over with and reset the deck, so to speak. But the market has maybe something else in mind. As we can see, five straight up days, and now we're starting to feel a sense of relief uh, for, for those of you that uh, have long positions at least. Some of you maybe have a very bearish portfolio, I don't know, but I'd have to guess that vast majority of you that are watching this right now uh, have a mostly long portfolio given what's happened in the markets over the last nine years, and given the fact that most of your 401k money and retirement money is in long-term investments like mutual funds, which generally don't short the market. So for the most part, I think 
um, not only America, but the world is breathing a sigh of relief that we've kind of stopped the bleeding to this point. Let's go ahead and take a look at a few more charts here. And uh, next chart I want to take a look at here is a four grid. And this particular version right here is going to show you the S&P 500 in the upper left, the Dow Jones Industrial Average in the upper right. We've got the NASDAQ in the lower left and the Russell 2000 in the lower right. Now, when you're looking at this particular view of mine here, the green background color of the chart signifies that according to the market forecast technical indicator, we have bullish postures on all four of these indices right now, meaning that the green lines, which is kind of the intermediate line that we use to develop our posture of those three market forecast lines, all of the green lines are pointing up. You can see down below here with the Russell 2000, uh, the Dow Jones, we've got the uh, S&P 500, and then the NASDAQ down below here. Um, in fact, the Russell 2000 actually went into the lower reversal zone, meaning it was very bearish there at its, at its, its worst moments a couple of weeks ago. And so it's good to see it actually come out of that uh, lower reversal zone and now is trending back towards the upper reversal zone where if it can get there would have a very bullish posture yet again. So long story short, it is good to see stabilization here kind of gives you the green light to take bullish trades again if you so desire as a trader. Remember for those of you that are investors, I've mentioned before many times and those of you that know me uh, as well as you do know that I'm a dividend growth investor. I, I don't use stop losses on my long term portfolio. Uh, I get out when I see dividend cuts or different things from a fundamental perspective. So I've been thankful that the markets have turned around because I didn't get stopped out of anything. Now in the paper money accounts that I manage, like the, the trend trading one that I did uh, for top down analysis, we did get stopped out of a few. But the good news on that front is that uh, we use weekly candles, not daily candles. And therefore we were able to withstand even a 10% pullback in a market in a quick amount of time with very few casualties. We're right back on track. In fact, I think, yeah, we're up about $15,000 on the year here. Uh, so thankfully we still have much of our Friday class portfolio intact and we were not stopped out, even though we were uh, forced to raise our stop losses up on quite a few of those names along the way. Now that I'm over here, I did want to remind you of something. I'm catching a glimpse of ABV here, which as you can see, we've got 113 shares of. We bought it back in June of 2017 for this account. And uh, we bought it at about $72.87. So we're up about $4,700 here in this paper money account. Now, ABV is kind of a special ticker to me because for those of you that used to attend my old classes through my old employer, you'll know that I taught two different trading rooms. I taught a long-term investing trading room uh, based on dividend growth investing. And I also taught a top-down analysis sector rotation type of trading class. So a trading class and an investing class. Well, AbV is one of the very rare crossover candidates of both of those classes. We owned AbV in both the dividend classes over time and then also in this top-down analysis class because it had a lot of price momentum. Not only was it a great dividend payer, remember AbV was spun off from Abbott Labs uh, several years ago and kind of inherited its dividend history and therefore Standard & Poor's allowed AbV to continue to be a dividend aristocrat company, meaning that it's raise its dividends or uh, its history suggests it raise its dividends for 25 years in a row or more. Well, anyway, reason I'm talking about AbV right now, uh, some of you that are following me on Twitter already caught this earlier today when I posted it, but let me just bring this up as another friendly reminder. If you're not following me uh, and you like this type of information, make sure you're doing so. In fact, there's a lot of you that I've noticed have just started following me lately, and I've known you for a long time, which reminds me again that some of you may think you're following me because you used to follow me at my old handle for my old company. So right now in your head, you're thinking you're following me, but you're actually not. This is a different account than I used to use with my old employer. And so make sure you just double check when you go to at Brandon Van Z on Twitter that it says following over here somewhere. But uh, back to AbV, take a look at this. Holy moly, AbV, 35% dividend increase. Now, I know not all of you are dividend-oriented investors, or at least not to the same degree that I am, uh, so you might not have proper context or perspective on whether it's 35% a lot, is it a little, is it in between. 35%, ladies and gentlemen, is absolutely enormous. 
uh, particularly given the circumstances of AbV. AbV is a massive company, more than a hundred billion dollar company whose share prices skyrocketed in recent years. Let's just take a quick peek of that. I'm gonna go back to just a single chart here and let's pull up AbV. And if we take a look at, let's say a three year weekly chart, you can see what I mean. Most of its move has been taking place in the last year. So if we kind of count back one year ago to uh, February of last year, you can see that in February of last year, it was about a $61 stock. It closed today at 115, meaning that it's almost doubled. In fact, it did double at its highest levels a couple of weeks ago from just a year ago. Um, AbbVie is a massive company. If we come back over here to the Analyze tab, uh, let's see if we can find the market cap of it just to prove my point. Yeah, it's down below. I know this is probably hard for you guys to see, but in the lower left, it shows market cap, $183 billion company. That's one of the largest healthcare companies on planet Earth. So I'm building all of that up because typically the uh, correlation that you find is that the bigger the company, the less the chance is that their dividend increase can be huge. Um, reason for that is first, it's absolute dollars. I mean, we're talking about dividend payments of billions of dollars at this point. Um, but in addition to that, the, a lot of times mega cap companies have already had a long illustrious history of paying out dividends. And so you find that their consistency is uh, what investors are really looking for. They're not necessarily looking for massive increases. So this is a monumental uh, increase. Now, one thing I do want to point out, and just for kind of an educational opportunity to uh, kind of you know teach you guys about this Thinkorswim platform as well, you'll notice here on Thinkorswim, when you pull up ABV on the trade tab, it first will say underlying right below the ticker symbol of ABBV. Uh, there's this little arrow that's generally pointing right. If you click on that arrow so that it's now pointing down like I did just there, then you'll find the dividend yield right here along with the PE ratio, the quarterly dividend amount, and the dividend frequency. Well, the reason I'm showing you this right now is because sometimes um, investors are caught off guard on the first day of the dividend increase because a lot of the financial companies, Thinkorswim's not alone uh, by any means from this perspective, but uh, what you'll find is that they indeed uh, are a little bit behind because the announcement of the dividend was just made today. If you look over here at some of the news items off to the right, you're going to find that it is, let me just find it here. Hang on, it went to my other screen. There we go. Uh, it shows that AbV shares are halted, last up 1% before the halt. And the company said it raised its quarterly cash dividend by 35% to 96 cents per share from 71 cents. So the point I'm trying to make here is you'll notice on the Thinkorswim platform, it still says 71 cents. That's the old amount. That will likely not get updated until tomorrow or later this week. So right now, the typical person that's looking at the platform is thinking to themselves, hmm, looks like ABV has about a 2.5% yield, which is still greater than the S&P 500, I might add. But that's not reflecting the 35% increase they just announced. So for those of you that are kind of newer to the idea of dividend investing, calculating your own yields and things like that, let's do that here just as an educational opportunity. So again, the new rate going forward as of right now is going to be 96 cents, even though that's not reflected on the Thinkorswim platform yet. So I'm going to get my calculator out. I take 96 cents, take that times four because that's a 96 cent quarterly dividend. We need to annualize that. So we take that by four quarters. And that means they're going to be paying out $3.84 per share uh, in the next year. And so we now take that number and divide it by the closing price of ABV tonight, which is 114.9. And you'll notice that their new yield is over 3%, 3.34%. So again, it's spectacular, it's massive. However, whatever adjective you wanna use, this is not normal. A lot of times, mega cap companies, if you're lucky, are gonna raise their dividend by, let's say eight, nine, if you're lucky, 10%. Um, but we've been seeing a string of mega cap companies with double digit increases. Some of you that were on Twitter the other day, 
um, probably caught some of the other ones that I was talking about. Let me go down to them and just highlight them here. Well, here's one. Clorox yesterday increased their dividend by 14.3%. So that's another dividend aristocrat company. Um, and then before that, two more dividend aristocrats. T. Rowe Price increased their dividends by 22.8%, and Pepsi increased its dividends by 15%. Now, Pepsi is a little bit of a, a different case. Uh, they're the only company that I know that does this. They actually um, announce their dividend increase in February that reflects the dividend that they're going to pay in two quarters from now, not next quarter. So that's a really tricky one that most people haven't paid attention to because it's not gonna be reflected on the financial platforms yet. But technically, you know in advance that come June 2018, they're gonna be paying their new rate that's 15% higher than where they're at right now. So. As always, I try to keep you guys posted on Twitter if you're interested in those dividend aristocrats that are raising their dividends. So just wanted to highlight that. I know not all of you are big dividend folks, but uh, I certainly am and I want to provide value there whenever I can. All right, let's get back on track with uh, some more analysis of the general markets after letting you know about that spectacular dividend increase of ABV. Uh, let's go over here to chart 6C. On this one, this is your three green arrows chart. And same uh, indices here, the same four in the United States. Uh, the background color is going to be different in this one in that it'll turn green when you have three green arrows, it'll turn red when you have three red arrows. Now I use daily candle charts for this particular view. And what you're likely noticing right now is that we have one chart, that's your NASDAQ, that's your tech heavy index, that indeed does have three green arrows as of today. We didn't have it as of yesterday, but with today's move higher in the NASDAQ, which is up 1.5%, Notice that we're now trading above that 30-day moving average, just like that. Fell out of bed a couple weeks ago, uh, zoomed back almost as quickly, and we're right back up above that moving average again. So we've got one green arrow, two green arrows, three green arrows. Uh, moving on now to our next chart here. This will be our longer term view. Not a lot different to report here than what I said on Tuesday. Remember, this is a long term view, so you don't see changing postures very often. In fact, the last time we had changing postures was well over a year ago. We're going on two years uh, in the case of the NASDAQ of being bullish if you're using the 1040 crossover method. So I don't have a whole lot more to add on that one compared to what I said on Tuesday. Uh, let's go ahead and now take a look at our 12 grids. And for this, I do have to cut the camera feeds so that way you guys can see all of them. Um, what a difference a week makes. Now remember, what we found from high to low, a 10% move had never taken place that quickly before, at least going back to the 1920s, what they have data for in the S&P 500. So what we just experienced with the S&P 500 from right here all the way down to right here, that was the quickest that has ever happened. Um, when you have that, you have major disruptions. And a few weeks ago, we had uh, one of the days, I don't remember what, what day it was exactly, but it was a day when I was doing these videos that we had all the sectors that would have been considered bearish. But here we are just a week or so later and all of the sectors are back to being bullish. Now what I'm using for this and why these charts are all green is I'm using the green intermediate line on the market forecast to judge what our posture should be. And you can kind of see those labels up above here. For example, if I'm looking at the materials, it says the intermediate term line is at 40.58 and rising. And so that would be considered bullish. So across the board, we do have bullishness. The one I do want to uh, point out because it does affect our uh, trade application example a little bit later today, uh, just pointing out up here in the upper right, industrials uh, continues to motor right along uh, and does have a bullish posture as of right now. Let's take a look at the foreign markets 12 grid now. Uh, boy, same thing. Across the board, clean sweep. We do have bullish postures using the intermediate term line on all foreign markets that I have uh, shown in front of you here uh, as well. Now, when we look at these, there are a few ways to kind of distinguish between them. You will notice that as an example, Brazil is now trading above a rising moving average. Same thing can be said for Russia, trading above a rising moving average. Same thing can be said for Mexico, trading above a rising 30-day moving average. 
And is there any others? Yes, there's one more right back here. In fact, this is the one that I highlighted a couple of sessions ago on Tuesday when I did the video. This is South Africa, and it's done nothing but go up since Tuesday. In fact, South Africa is knocking on the door of hitting new multi-year highs here. You can see how close it is to where it peaked out here just before we hit our rough patch with volatility a couple of weeks ago. So foreign markets zooming higher right along with the US markets. Now let's take a look at our intermarket analysis. And then remember, these are things that are not stock oriented necessarily. And as you might expect, volatility fell yet again. So one, two, three, four, five straight days to the downside of volatility. Totally expected considering the S&P 500 has had five straight up days. Remember, those two things are genuinely are gen generally uh, inversely correlated to one another. Now, one thing I did want to point out, you'll notice that the TNX did fall today. Uh, TNX was down 0.76. Remember, that's your interest rates here in the United States. And uh, that did affect the way that the sectors shook out here today. So if I come over here quickly to the Market Watch tab, I do have the sectors kind of ranked first to last here uh, on a one day basis. And you'll notice who's right up there at the top. It is the utilities followed by uh, telecom, which are both very interest rate sensitive. They provide very juicy yields. If you think about things like uh, Southern Company uh, or Duke Energy um, in the utility space, along with companies like Verizon and AT&T in the telecom space. So when you find interest rates falling, you'll typically find uh, interest rate sensitive areas like utilities and telecom doing reasonably well. A lot of times you will find the real estate companies doing well as well, but but, you know, today, for whatever reason, XLRE was kind of a middle of the pack group. So I don't know if that's just an anomaly or what, uh, but obviously even middle of a pack on a day like today is still nearly a 1% advance. So uh, a good kind of stabilization in some of those interest rate sensitive areas as well. In fact, I saw that uh, the, the consumer staples did very well. Some of you know that uh, I think it was one week ago that I, uh, as my trade application example, uh, use Procter and Gamble. And so let me show you that real quick to see where we've come from. And that when I did the video, it was hovering right around 80 bucks. And so it's very good to see those of you uh, that got into Procter and Gamble. Uh, it's up over two dollars per share uh, over that time, which is actually a fairly significant move for a very slow and boring uh, consumer staples company like Procter and Gamble. All right, now that I have this chart pulled up, let's just top things off with our trade example application idea for the day. And in some respects, it's kind of like Procter and Gamble, meaning that what I'm looking for here is high quality merchandise that has pulled back. And what we find is that UPS has had a massive pullback in price. Now, what we're looking at here is a chart that eventually my uh, uh, clients of, of, of market scholars will have access to once we get our uh, classes up and running again here, which hopefully will be uh, reasonably soon. Um, what we're looking at here is what I call my, my dividend stair step chart. You might want to think about this like dividend support in a way. Um, what this green line is tracking is average high yields over a certain time period where you generally find some stability in price for the underlying security. And you can see here recently Union, uh, not Union Pacific, United Parcel Service, UPS, raised its dividend. Now those numbers are listed back here, 83 cents and they raised it to 91 cents. Don't pay any attention to the placement of these numbers. It's the numbers themselves that will tell you whether they boosted or, or cut the dividend. So they, they boosted their dividend from 83 cents to 91 cents. Now, U, UPS is not a dividend aristocrat, so it's not kind of as illustrious as uh, Procter & Gamble. Uh, reason for that is UPS, you can see back here, 2008 and 2009, they kept the dividend the same over those two years. So I do want to distinguish that. Um, many of you that have attended my dividend classes in the past know that I put an asterisk next to those uh, types of companies. The reason for that is they did show me something. They showed me that they did not want to cut the dividend. That's very important to me. So they had every excuse on the planet to cut that dividend back in 08, 09 when it seemed like the financial sky was falling and cyclical companies like a transportation stock like this would have had a very good excuse to cut the dividend. 
They didn't raise the dividend, they didn't cut the dividend, they kept it the same, but because they did that, it, it doesn't allow them to have um, a 25 year plus streak of increasing the dividends. All in all, I consider UPS a very good dividend payer nonetheless, and on top of that, I think of them as having an outstanding economic moat, uh, meaning that it'd be hard for competitors to steal away market share from them. Now, the reason you're getting this pullback is Amazon. And so for each one of you, you have to make that decision. If you decide to add UPS to your long-term portfolio here, you have to ask yourself, do you personally believe Amazon will steal market share away from UPS? Or will they continue to have a friendly relationship in which UPS earns business from Amazon? Seems like Amazon has a lot of irons in the fire. You know, we've heard about what they're trying to do with healthcare. Um, we see what they're already doing with Whole Foods. Uh, there's, you know, a lot of rumblings of what they might want to do in an in industrial distribution. So there's always rumors out there. Hey, Amazon's going to get into this business and it clobbers a share price. Well, this stock has gone from $135 down to 108 in just a heartbeat. I mean, it touched its new high, all-time high of $135, just here on January 15th. That was exactly one month ago. So in one month's time, this thing has fallen $27 per share. Now what that has done is possibly created an opportunity. That's if you don't believe we're gonna go into some sort of economic tailspin here. If you do, then I would expect that an industrial company like UPS will struggle. On the other hand, if you believe that that 10% pullback that we had a couple of weeks ago was a momentary blip and we're gonna be right back to all-time highs in the general stock market, then I would argue that UPS represents a very interesting opportunity here. You can see that where it's trading now is right in line with this green line, meaning that its yield right now is at a historically attractive level. You can see that in the past right here, it bounced off of that green line. You can also see over here, it almost touched that green line before bouncing and it came down here uh, in 2011, bounced off that green line, kept on going. You can see it did it over here in 2010 as well. And of course, like a lot of stocks, it was trading well below that green line in the 0809 financial crisis. But in general, normal market conditions, this typically is a company that does well when its dividend yield is 3.36% like it is right now. So for those of you that don't know how to trade options and you just wanna build a long-term portfolio of buy and monitor types of stocks, I think UPS could be a good fit right along with uh, what you did uh, a week ago with Procter & Gamble. I have a little diversification there, one being a consumer staples company, this one being uh, an uh, industrial company. So here's another one that's not options-based. This is going to be a stock-based type of portfolio uh, trade here for our example today. Uh, so that way you guys can have a few of those along the way because I know David and I do generally a lot of uh, options related types of, of trade ideas. So here's a long-term investment idea for you at a level that I think is uh, more than fair for a very high quality player uh, in a world dominating type of a company that's currently out of favor because of rumors, not verified facts, but rumors that Amazon is going to either take business away from them or start their own transportation company or whatever. And so uh, I'll leave it up to you to determine whether it's a good fit for your portfolio and how many shares you should be buying. So. With that, let's go ahead and wrap things up for the day. Thank you as always for joining us here on these Market Outlook videos. It's a pleasure to go to work for you as often as we get an opportunity to. Uh, David will be back with you tomorrow, so uh, make sure you're tuning into that. He does outstanding work. And uh, remember to retweet and like uh, these Market Outlook videos on Twitter for us if you get value out of them and uh, let others know uh, about the, uh, the, the analysis that we do here. We can't thank you enough for that. Have a great night, everybody, and I'll look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Take care, bye-bye.